economist. Can you explain us what uh, health economist means? A health economist, right. The best way to explain that is to say that we're looking at the economics of health. So, for example, in my role with um, Parkinson's disease, we're looking at the economics of Parkinson's. So we're comparing the costs and the effects of uh, the new intervention, deep brain stimulation, compared with medical therapy. And as a health economist, the way that we do that is by using an economic evaluation framework. And so we compare the costs, the extra costs involved, and we um, compare that with the extra benefits gained. And we come up with cost effectiveness ratios and all sorts of different outcomes to, to really to show the worthwhileness of new interventions in healthcare. As health economists, we work um, independently. Um, we're funded often by government bodies like MRC and um, the university, so on. Um, so we produce independent results on um, evidence of cost effectiveness of drugs or interventions, and we really publish that in peer reviewed journals, um, present it publications, present it. Um, conference and so on and so really decision makers will use our evidence in their decision making but we don't make the decisions ourselves. Maybe I can ask you uh, abruptly how much does the BS cost? <laughs> well we do have we do have um, quite a lot of cost data already um, but as I said the key factor is that um, deep brain stimulation um, will really um, requires long-term cost and effect data to come up with that cost effectiveness, the unbiased cost effectiveness result. Um, but we can tell you that, for example, the cost of the surgical scenario, so for example, the, the pre, pre-operative clinic visits, um, hospital length of stay, um, theatre costs, um, test procedures, the costs of the IPG implant, the electrodes, the patient controller, all that together, this being the sort of surgical episode, is just is around about £16,000. Um, but in addition to that, we have to look at um, any, any longer term serious adverse events, the cost of replacing the battery, um, the cost of any infections, the cost of the medication for those in the medical arm, so apomorphine is an expensive drug. Um, so longer term costs and benefits really are, are important in this scenario. So what are the real parameters you weight in your examination and are all numerical or also do you consider qualitative aspects of life for example? The costs are pretty easily identifiable and measurable um, and, and value, valued because we have available unit costs available in the UK, so NHS reference costs and things. So um, we're looking at you know clinic costs, hospital costs, theatre costs, staff costs, equipment costs, um, hospital stay, and then we're looking into the broader costing, costing such as um, community costs, visits to the GP, social care, personal social services, um, and then on into institutional care such as um, care homes for the elderly. And, you know, it's very broad. I think I think a very broad perspective is recommended in costing. So we, we talk about the societal perspective being the ideal perspective so that all the costs impacting every budget, including the patient, are picked up on um, to give us a, a good economic evaluation basis. Um, and the benefits we are using clinical outcome measures um, in addition to quality of life measures, EQ5D, the PDQ39, which is a Parkinson's disease specific questionnaire. Um, and we really try to collect a battery of outcome measures so that we, when we combine the costs and benefits together, we can give a, a very broad picture. Um, and, and beyond that, I think the problem in Parkinson's disease, we, we've talked about a lot, is um, the problem in valuing, the, the, the problem of valuing the important attributes to pe- people with Parkinson's. Um, and it may be that the, the outcome measures that we have are maybe not sufficient and that we need to use or develop measures which are broader. From talking to Parkinson's disease patients, it may be that there's just broader attributes um, around about capabilities of daily living that maybe are more important to them. Getting out to see their friends, being able to drive, you know, there are other things which are maybe not specifically health related, but are very highly valued.
do you foresee an increasing use of uh, DBS in uh, for for brain related disorders? Um, I think it's the case that deep brain stimulation for brain disorders has has very much taken off um, as a technology in in, in sur- the surgical arena, um, and I think there's there's a, there's a, there's a lag with the the clinical. Um, the data from randomised controlled trials and and then again from the economic evaluations alongside those trials. There's a lag in that data. So the use of the technology has taken off um, and what we need to do now is is put together the economic evaluation evidence um, to basically assess whether this is going to really be funded. You know, for example, in the UK, um, it's very important that we provide evidence of cost effectiveness and in order to do that, we have to have long-term costs and benefit information. So it's really not enough that the technology is taking off. We need to have cost-effectiveness evidence um, so that we can ensure that we're allocating our resources to the best possible use, which will be the best possible benefit for our population. So it's really important that we have economic evidence um, behind the, 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 this technology so that it doesn't just take off... Um, and, 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 t- and take resources away from other areas which are more cost effective.